Um, as, you, uh, as, you're, as you're finding your way back to your seat, I, I did want to uh, make a couple comments about the uh, recommended resources. So if you want, if you're interested in some of these resources or if you have questions about them, you can always ask. Uh, you can ask me or Ann or any of the ladies here at GBC. Um, I, I want to make a few comments. Uh, I wanted to give you some, some resources that were um, just have been helpful. Uh, Ann and I kind of compiled on these and came up with this list. A um, couple of these probably bear some mention because, um, first of all, let me just make the comment. Uh, you, you, you heard my, uh, my, my reference to Alan Francis, and that's on here. I went ahead and put it on here. I, I, I hesitated, but then I realized, well, I can qualify that. So Alan Francis is, uh, is, is actually a, uh, it was a practicing um, psychiatrist uh, who taught at Duke. So his book, Saving Normal, is actually a really helpful book uh, for, for some. <laughs> it's a helpful book for some. So this is by no means a book that you need to read. He's not a, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. Um, he, here's why I included it, and this, and this is probably not even something that the, I wouldn't even imagine the, the majority of you would even want to read, but because this is such a, um, a great discipling, counseling church, I wanted you to have a resource that would help you understand kind of uh, what... what what, what's, what's coming at the, the typical person when we think about um, uh, diagnoses, mental health disorders, and particularly the, diag the connection of diagnostics to uh, big pharma and all of the, uh, the money making. So this book really kind of exposes that in a very clear, very simple way. Uh, so if, if you're confused about that, if that's helpful for you, that's great. If, if, it's, if it's helpful, I mean, really the, the value of this is it doesn't help give you a biblical perspective. What it does is it helps you if you're in counseling or discipling or helping somebody, it helps you to articulate and understand where they're coming from. Um, and it can be a help in that. So that's, it's kind of like put an asterisk on that one. I'm not recommending that everybody needs to, you're not, a, you're not an unfaithful Christian if you never buy that book and if you could care less about reading it. Uh, but for some of you, it might be a good resource. Uh, the rest of these are going to be um, really edifying resources coming from a, per, a Christian perspective. Um, and I would just say, like, it, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the books about fear, basically, Jerry Bridges, The Joy of Fearing God, John Bunyan, The Fear of God, Jeremiah Burroughs, Gospel Fear, and um, Albert Martin, there it is. The Forgotten Fear, Where Have All the God-Fearers Gone? Those are all great books, and I wanted to give you those, those to you. Um, I, I would say, if you're asking, you know, like a, a ranking, if, if you're really wanting to read about the fear of the Lord, honestly, the best thing I've ever read is Jeremiah Burroughs, uh, the best thing outside of the Bible. He just, these are his expositions, and it's extremely helpful. So if, if, you're, if you're thinking, man, what I want to read on the, on the fearing God type side of things, uh, read the Jeremiah Burroughs volume. Um, and uh, the rest of those, there's several dealing with aspects of fear, so you can, I think they're pretty self-explanatory, um, you know, like Priolo uh, fearing man. So, um, anyway, I think that's, that's it, all I wanted to say on that, but if you have any more specific questions, you can ask uh, me or Anne during one of the breaks. All right, ladies, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to dive right back in. We, um, we've got a few minutes here uh, before lunch to look at one more passage of scripture. And I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Uh, last session we saw from Jesus, we learned what's so wrong about anxiety, why it's so bad. And this afternoon, we're going to learn about killing fear and killing anxiety. But in this text, we learn that you can be worried away from the Word. Worries and distractions can prevent you from being focused on the main thing, your spiritual priority, not spiritual priorities. Your priority, singular, must be learning from Christ, learning from His Word, devoted to Jesus Christ personally. This story about Mary and Martha, it's, it's only recorded by Luke. There's no parallel. This is the only access we have to this account is right here in these five short verses. It was not written for us to try to identify whether we're more like Mary or more like Martha or whether we're nor naturally or personality-wise closer to resembling one versus the other. 
It's not written to evaluate how we're doing on the, on the worry meter. It's just a simple, profound story about how the nature of concerns pull us away from the word. In a sense, we might say that there's, this story shows us that there's a, a degree of a worldly concern that can hinder and thwart us as believers, and that, that an, an unbeliever who's dominated by those concerns, dominated by those worries and, and, and fears, um, there's a correlation between the unbeliever who's enslaved and ruled by those desires and a believer who slips into it to certain degrees. Here we start to see what happens with um, a, a woman who, who's thinking begins to start to resemble um, the unbelievers and in degrees is pulled away from devotion to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have any reason to think that Martha is not a believer. I have every reason to think that she loves the Lord. I have every reason to think that her service in, recorded in this story was done originally out of a desire to serve Christ. But we see that her motives are impure and we see that she becomes distracted. This uh, story that we're about to read with Mary and Martha actually resembles the parable that Jesus just got through telling a few chapters earlier. And I want to turn in here for a second. Keep your finger in Luke um, 10 because we're going to spend our time there. But just turn back two chapters to uh, Luke chapter 8 and look at the, the parable of the sower. And when, when we read through this, um, I want you to pay attention to this, the thorns, the third soil, because the third soil is categorically the unbeliever, and Martha begins to picture the believer who begins to look like the third soil. Verse 4, when a large crowd was coming together and, and those from various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And he said, to the, he said these things, um, and I'm sorry, as he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The disciples are questioning what this meant. He pulls them aside and begins to explain the parable. In verse 12, he says, Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and watch this, as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. Of course, the parable is not a parable about the gospel. It's a parable about the soils. The same seed, the same gospel is scattered to all, and the difference is the soils. The difference is the heart. And so the third soil is the unbeliever who hears the gospel and has temporary response to truth, Here's um, uh, God, God's glory on display in the scriptures, and there's a temporary response to that revelation. But in the long run, the response to the word is choked out. The person is choked with worries, cares, concerns, concerns and burdens about riches and pleasures of this life, the stuff of this life. And that's an unbeliever who produces no fruit. That's an unbeliever who's enslaved They worship this life. They live for this life. They are temporally minded. They have no hope for eternity. And they are enslaved to worry about this world. Now, when we turn to Luke chapter 10 and the story of Mary and Martha, Mary gives us a picture of 
what it looks like for a believer to become so distracted with worry and concern and anxiety that it actually prevents her from the one thing, the needful thing, from sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from his word. It's actually an inversion of priorities, and it is a very, very instructive story. Let's start in verse 40, 38. Now, as they were traveling along, so they, obviously, Jesus with his disciples and this, the disciples who were uh, watching his ministry, benefiting from him, he entered a village, and he, uh, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, that's a simple introduction to the story. What's really helpful about this story, this is, uh, you're going to have to kind of take my word for it. Um, as Luke writes this story, the way he tells it, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's clear that verse 38 is just kind of like, that's the beginning of the story, and it's just a normal action sequence. And then, I like to, I like to describe it this way. I've, I've done this before here. If you compared this to a movie, if Luke was the uh, script writer or the uh, director of the movie, well, 38 would be acted out by the characters on screen. And then verse 39 and 40a would not be char- acted out by the, by the, in the screenplay. The cinematographer would not write this into the script. The narrator would be telling us these details. So what happens is it has the effect of when you read the story, verse 39 and 40a, it's not being acted out. That's not part of the action sequence. That's not what's on screen. That's just the narrator saying, now... Let me tell you some details here. So as you see Jesus enter, and you see Mary, uh, uh, or sorry, as you see Martha welcoming Jesus into her home, the narrator would start to tell you these details, and these details are critical to understand the rest of the action sequence. So as the actors unfold the story from verse 40b all the way through, this information needs to be kept in our minds. So Luke, the narrator, would say this. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And the narration ends. So Luke, as a narrator, sets up a contrast and says, okay, Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. That's just acted out in front of us. But then you realize, okay, there's this sister, and she's evidently not helping. <laughs> she's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening, and Martha was distracted. And it's interesting that this word for distracted is a word that's it's, it's, it's drawn away. It's drawn away. Uh, the root of it is ironically used. Not ironically, it makes sense, but it's just not a different context. Typically, it's used in contexts where you, know, you draw a sword, so you would draw it away from the scabbard. That's a very typical use for this word. So now, Martha is being drawn away from something, and we'll get to that in verse 41 and 42, but she's being drawn away with all her preparations. And the NAS has, has an excellent footnote, says much service. And that's literally what it has in the original. She's drawn away with much service, much ministry, much, de- many details, sorry, many details, much ministry. She, she has so much on her plate. There's so much weighing her down. There's so much to do. So here's Martha, as the narrator tells us, just picture and keep this in mind that Martha's got the mental day planner and it is lengthy and she is checking boxes off. She's working through that mental day planner and she is just being extremely diligent, she might imagine. And, and by the way, as we work through this story, ladies, this is not a rebuke to anyone who is diligent. This is not a rebuke to anyone who is a, a go-getter. This is not a, your uh, ladies who you get after it and you are productive and you are effective, your energy level and your contribution is absolutely useful and needed. And this is not a rebuke of that. It's a rebuke of those burdens and worries and cares and concerns distracting you from the priority. And it's interesting in Christianity, we often talk about priorities. What are your priorities? What are your priorities in this and in that and in this role and in priorities, priorities, priorities? And this is really simple. This isn't plural. It's priority. There's no priority two. There's no priority three. There's no priority four. It's just this is the priority. And Martha's getting pulled away from it. She is, as you will see, worried away from the word. 40B, Luke picks up the action sequence. So now we return to the 
actors on stage, and Martha is coming up to him. She, she approaches him, and she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? You can just hear it in Martha's tone. <laughs> she is just, she's not having it. She is frustrated. I, I, I kind of wonder, I mean, you, you know, there's probably some sort of sister squabble happening here, maybe un, unspoken. <laughs> you know, I can imagine, like, like, was Mary, like, what was it like for Mary? Mary is sitting there, she's at his feet, and Martha just keeps walking by. And she keeps coming in, you know, and, and, and they're probably, I, I picture Jesus and Mary just talking about truth at the dining room. I don't know. I don't even know if they had a dining room. All I know is, like, that's where I'm picturing it. And I'm picturing Martha coming in, coming out, walking by the door, looking in. She's still not serving. You know, it's interesting, too. She probably would have had a little bit of uh, frustration and disdain about what was happening culturally. Culturally, I can, Im- I can imagine that Martha would have been very, uh, probably felt a lot of sympathy or reinforcement from the common view about women learning the Torah. One commentator said this, most self-respecting rabbis would not teach a woman the law, even if the woman were his daughter. Such, at least, was the view of Rabbi Eleazar, who said, quote, everyone who teaches his daughter Torah is as if he taught her promiscuity and, quote, better to burn the Torah than to teach it to women. Wow. I mean, that obviously has nothing to do with Scripture. Uh, that has to do with ridiculous abuses of Hebrew grammar, you know, when Deuteronomy 6, teach your children, and it's just plural sons. Of course it's plural sons, because if it's a mixed company, then you just use the masculine gender. That's just a grammar issue. That's not an anti feminine that's not, that's not against women. And so this has nothing to do with the Scriptures. This has nothing to do with God's heart. Jesus teaching Mary personally, that has everything to do with God's heart. <laughs> but I wonder if that wasn't even in Martha's mind. And I wonder if every place setting that came in just suddenly got heavier and the exhale got louder. <sighs> I don't know. But it, reads, it reaches critical mass uh, Martha can't take it anymore, and she just goes right up to Jesus. And how ironic, you know, she doesn't even talk to Mary about it. She doesn't even bring it to Mary. She just goes straight to Jesus. It's like, yeah, forget that. Hey, Jesus, listen up. And she starts correcting Christ. <laughs> I mean, we got, we got a lot going on here. <laughs> we do not have time to outline all that's going wrong with this thinking. You are rebuking the Messiah. <laughs> so she says, Lord, don't you care? Yep, that's the problem. Jesus doesn't care anymore. Jesus doesn't care for me. You know, we're going to learn this afternoon, we're going to look at 1 Peter 5, and honestly, that is theology on display. We have to believe that God doesn't care at some practical level to be anxious. And Martha's not at her best here, and she's falling prey to that. I think she's genuinely asking not even realizing, you know, now we have an inspired record of her statement, and it ministers to us year after year, century after century, and she's glorified, not that she's reading Luke 10, but she's, she's, a, she's, she's waiting her, glor- her glorified body, but she's a saint, and she's been perfected, and I can only imagine, she's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that was my thinking on display, there it was, <laughs> questioning whether Christ cares. Don't you care that my sister has left me? Now, the word that she uses to, with, to leave is like forsake. So the word clearly is insinuate, has the connotation that Mary was already serving. So Mary, has, it's not that she's just at the feet learning and Martha's doing the serving. It's that Mary was doing the serving and has forsaken that post and has now chosen to do something else. And so Martha's sitting there Huffing and puffing, perhaps. <laughs> a little bit of an exaggeration. I don't, it's not in the text, of course. She's frustrated. It's bothering her. She's trying to be diligent in her own thinking. 
This is important. We got to get a, a meal for the Messiah, and this meal had better be good. And so she's thinking, I hope it's as good as what the pioneer woman does on TV. I hope the place setting looks like Johanna Gaines. I'm thinking, and so she's got all of this and all these standards in her mind that she is striving to meet. And then there's her sister who's not, she, not only did she, she's, no, she's not helping, she stopped helping. I mean, it's making it worse. This is all falling to me. I mean, we could be nailing this thing. We could be putting on top notch meal if she wasn't sitting over there just jacking about the word. And so she says, not only does she ask the question, she just flat out tells Jesus, then tell her to help me. Obviously, Jesus, if you cared, you would command my sister to come help me, to come give me assistance. Watch this. In what I've chosen to do. So... Mary is having personal devotions with Christ in person, and Martha is busy with much service, so many details. Mary's listening to the word of Christ. Martha is busy serving Christ. And I, let me say this, because I don't, want, I don't want you to walk away from this text thinking that what's about to happen, this, this rebuke does not happen because Martha should not have been serving the, the, the problem in this story is not Martha's service. It's her priorities. There, there's good and proper concerns. Um, serving Christ a meal is an amazing privilege. Showing hospitality to Jesus Christ himself. And then, of course, Jesus turns around and says to the degree that you did it to the least of these, my brother, and you did it to me, showing hospitality to the least ranking Christian in the kingdom who could not possibly pay you back, but you did it because you love Christ, is the exact same privilege. Hospitality is not of second-rate importance. It is the display of the gospel. It is a qualification for leadership in the church. This is not a rebuke to you ladies who have high level of gifting in the hospitality area. That is absolutely critical. This is an inversion of priorities. When Luke tells us in his, his background that she was distracted with these preparations, I get it. I get it. Martha's not... She's not being distracted by worldly pursuits. She's being distracted by good pursuits. You understand? So this is trying to clarify exactly what Luke is documenting for us because that's important to understand why Jesus, Jesus says what he's going to say here in just a moment. I, I get it. I'm a pastor. There, there's, there are so many things that could be consuming in my life. Teaching the Word, studying the Word, and you know, teaching seminary classes and counseling and spearheading a leadership conversation or whatever I could just put my hand to. I mean, I could put my hand to a lot of things. And then on top of that, just being a dad and just trying to be faithful in the community and trying to be faithful in the church as a Christian and, and the needs to be met. And all of those are great. All of those are good. And all of those could become an inversion of priorities. I've had to tell myself this so many times. What if, what if my standard of a good sermon in attempts to serve the church to clarify truth is actually an inversion of priorities? And I've had to say yes to obedience in other areas and preach what I might view in the flesh as a second-rate service, but know that the Lord was pleased because I continued to obey in my heart. I know that struggle. And I'm not saying that it's easy. But we have a help here because in this moment, Martha's not doing well and she fails the test. She's distracted. She's pulled and drawn away. And we see that because her response to Christ in verse 40 is absolutely self-absorbed. She's self-absorbed because she tells, tells Jesus, tell her to help me. 
It's also clear that it's, she's distracted and her motives are not pure because she is convinced that the Lord doesn't care if the Lord is actually con- going to continue teaching her, his, her sister uh, the word. I mean, she's listening to his word, and she's got other priorities. So clearly, she has made the meal a priority. She has actually made her contribution to the meal and her service a priority. She has clearly reached the level in her heart motives where she's getting personal significance from her hospitality. Why would I say that? Because if Martha were simply making the right choice, you know what? This is an incredible privilege. I want to serve Christ and get this meal ready. And she had the priority that there's nothing more important than honoring Christ and worshiping him in personal devotion to him. And she saw that by serving Christ, by preparing a meal, enabled her sister to sit at his feet and worship and grow and learn and become more like Christ. She would be saying, oh, this is awesome. Lord, help me to prepare this meal by myself so that my sister can benefit from hearing his word. And she might have even said, if she were really thinking about it, wait, Lord, I I, I do want to serve this meal. Is that the right priority? Should I also be sitting at your feet? Should we be eating an hour late? Or should I keep going? If she didn't know, she could have asked. But there's self-will here, and she's chosen priorities. She's chosen personal priorities based on her own significance, based on her own strengths, and now she's imposing them on her sister, and she's now imposing them on Christ, starting to question Christ's character if he doesn't agree with her priorities. Wow. Wow. Godet rightly said this, The two sisters have often been regarded as representing two equally legitimate aspects of the Christian life, inward devotion and practical activity. But Martha does not in the least represent external activity such as Jesus approves. So the issue is not inward, you know, quietism, some sort of, you know, personal devotions your entire life and you never actually get around to obeying versus only externals. That's not the point. Her distraction proves that The motive of her work is not pure and that her self-importance as hostess has a larger share in it than it ought to. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so that's why we are shocked. That's why we're not shocked. We actually understand what Martha's doing here. When she questions the Lord's character, she questions his care and concern because he obviously has to sign up to agree to her priorities. And then she starts telling him that Mary needs to agree to her priorities as well. And the issue is, she needs to help me. Verse 41. The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Now, you know, if he says your name twice, you better, you better pay attention. <laughs> There's going to be some correction coming. And it's very gracious. You are worried and bothered about so many things. The first word worried is the same word that we saw last hour in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, we saw this worry, the anxiety, the concern to be unduly concerned about something, and that's clearly what's happening here. This word bothered means means troubled or distracted. It has roots that have a connotation of disorder, disturbance, agitation, noise, clamor, confusion, unrest, turmoil. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And you know what's funny is... we, it's easy to read this story, and we're so glad that it's like, oh yeah, Martha, man, unfortunately, <laughs> she's just not at her best. And as soon as you start looking at that rebuke, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know what it's like to be a Martha. The worry, the concern, the clamor. When we have responsibilities heaping up on our shoulders, and and. The specifics of those responsibilities are going to vary from woman to woman, and mine might be different than yours, but that really doesn't matter, does it? We're all, we all have full day planners. We all have responsibilities, and we're looking at those responsibilities, and we're thinking, we've got to get after this. And after all, I just want to be faithful. After all, I just want to serve. After all, I just want to knock all this out and do it for, for the Lord, of course. But when you find your heart agitated, frenetic, clamoring, 
when your ministry and your service isn't done, and it's not calculated, built on biblical principle, because you've thought the issue through and you know what would be the priority in the moment, and you're doing it out of devotion to Christ, and you're thrilled that you get to do it, but you start to see entitlement, you start to see expectation, you start to feel the turmoil and the clamor in your heart because you have burdens and you have, how am I going to get it all done, and this has got to happen, and you know that is the state that Martha was in. It pulled her away from the word. It pulled her away from her devotion to Christ. Suddenly, she's no longer serving. Not suddenly. I mean, these, these, are, these are principles. These are priorities that she has built up, and it's starting to manifest themselves now here in this moment. But she is, she is serving out of self-significance, and she's got goals that she's aiming at with her ministry and her service that are not simply a privilege to serve Christ humbly, There's concerns about, am I going to be able to pull this off? She's doing it in the flesh. Ladies, when you find your heart agitated, frenetic, fighting fearfully to keep everything together, to finish all the to-dos on your mental day planner, you need to start asking yourself whether your priorities have gotten out of whack. And you've got to ask yourself, have I lost sight of the priority, singular? The more your heart is devoted to the Lord, the more humble, the more you'll be at peace, the more you'll be at rest, the more ease there will be, the more there will be contentment. Even if the responsibility seems insurmountable, you'll trust the Lord in it. Serving in the way that God's called you to will be a joy, and when it's not, it's time to go back to sit at Christ's feet and sit at his, under his word until you can serve with joy. I want to show you real quick, because of Jesus' words, the the worry and the the turmoil even, I want to go back and look at James 3 for a second. So we're going to to just do one quick cross-reference. And I want to remind you of James 3, because this is a helpful passage in light of uh, trying to shepherd our hearts when we find ourselves in a Martha moment. James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18, describes wisdom from above and wisdom from below. And this is really a description of the difference between somebody who's operating according to human wisdom versus somebody who's operating according to divine wisdom. So if you've been given wisdom from the Lord, if you've sat at his feet and you have learned from his word, then your life is going to be marked by this kind of wisdom. But if you're, if you're operating on, relying on your own wisdom, your life's going to be marked by the wisdom from below. And it's actually interesting I, we don't know from this story what, what prompted Mary to make the decision that she made. We don't know what prompted her to make that decision. She obviously made the right decision. Martha should have also made the same decision. Not that she shouldn't have been serving, but obviously her heart was not right. And so she's operating according to wisdom from below. So look at the contrast. We'll pick it up in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Okay, we'll pause right there for a second because I've, you know, I've, I've often asked myself, you know, when I, when I, before I really studied this passage, I used to think about this passage and think, It's kind of a strange phrase. Why why would James say, don't be arrogant and lie against the truth? I mean, like, if you're selfishly ambitious, how are you lying against the truth? You're just selfishly ambitious. But the point being, in verse 13, he's already said, who's wise and understanding? He's talking about people who are claiming to be wise and understanding, and it's not really an issue of whether you claim it. It's an issue if if you show it. So in 13b, he says, let him show it. Who cares if somebody says they're wise? The person who actually is wise is the person who shows it. So now in verse 14, it's it's like the assumption here is that somebody has claimed to be wise, but they are actually arrogant. So now you're claiming to know the truth, but your life is disproving it. So your life is a walking lie against the truth. So don't be arrogant and lie against the truth if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Instead, it's earthly, natural, and demonic. See, what's so profound about this? Wisdom from below, it's earthly, natural, and demonic. It's earthly and natural. It's just natural to who we are as fallen human beings. It's natural. It's also demonic. 
And, you know, it's just helpful to even think about that. If I find myself in a Martha moment trying to do what I think God has called me to do in the externals, and my heart is agitated, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not content, I'm failing in the heart priority of just devotion to simple devotion to Christ, I got to ask myself, what am I motivated by? If I see that, I need to tell myself, that's demonic thinking. Whoa, seriously? You tell yourself? Yeah, I actually tell myself that. That's, that's demonic. In my mind, I try to go back to Matthew 16. Jesus calls Peter Satan because he's seeking not the things of God, but the things of man. When we see Martha, slash, when we see ourselves having a Martha moment, we need to remind ourselves, I'm concerned, I'm burdened, I'm worried, I'm anxious, I'm distracted from prior the priority because I have demonic thinking right now. I'm actually focused on the things of man. I'm, th I'm focused on the externals. I'm focused on the horizontals. I'm focused on reputation. I'm focused on what this looks like. I'm focused on fill in the blank. It is demonic. Verse 16 explains why. Because where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And you see that in Martha. She's just erupting here, um, telling Jesus what to do, imposing personal priorities over Jesus and over Martha. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, it's pure. Then it's peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness, is sown by peace, in peace, sorry, by those who make peace. So you can, just, you, can just, you can just rewrite this story with Martha operating according to wisdom from above and go back to Luke 10, and this is what that would look like. She'd be serving. There'd be no increasingly louder exhales every trip into the dining room. In fact, she would be increasingly quiet because she would be thrilled at the opportunity to serve not just Christ, but her sister. And she would be thinking, what a sweet opportunity I have here to serve both of them, getting the meal ready so that they can talk about the truth. And she might even just say, hey, Jesus, should we wait on the meal? I'd love to be a part of that conversation. But I'll, I'll keep serving if you want. Peaceable, pure, gentle, easily persuaded, yields to Christ. But Jesus rebukes her and helps her and explains that you're worried and bothered by so many things. We see that Martha's not serving for the right reasons. If she were, she would not have told Jesus to get with her agenda. If she had made a conscientious decision at this moment, the best thing she could do was to serve Christ and her family a meal. She would have been thrilled to just continue serving. And if her personal, her personal significance hadn't gotten in the way, then um, she would have just simply kept serving or asked Jesus what's the most needful. But here in verse 42 now, we see what was most needful. Jesus continues and says, but only one thing is necessary. Only one thing is needful. There's only one thing that ought to be. There's only one thing, technical definition, that which should happen or be supplied because it's needed. That which is lacking and needed. The thing that is lacking. It's a necessary thing. However you want to say it, there's one thing needful, one thing necessary. There's only one priority. For Mary has chosen the good part, the good portion. And even the word that Jesus used sounds like he's making a play on words with the cuisine and the culinary uh, function that's happening in the kitchen. And he says, she's chosen the good portion. And so he even uses words from the kitchen. So choosing what? The good portion? Well, it's kind of like the uh, prioritizing which is the good portion of the meal, the difference between the, the moist brisket and the ground beef, the difference between the large, pristine piece of pizza or the last piece that has been picked through by a greedy teenager uh, and all the toppings taken off. Here, you have that. Or the gooey brownie versus the brownie-colored crouton. I mean, this is the good portion. Jesus says, 
She's chosen the good portion. Ladies, it's interesting. Mary had to make a choice. Keeping this priority, the priority in your life, is not just going to happen. It's going to require a decision. And I mentioned, I understand the tension. We have to make these decisions. And it is difficult at times. There's difficulties you have, pressures and tensions, and you're trying to figure out how do I weigh them all. It's like, okay, if I, if I have... If I have this responsibility uh, burdening me and, I, and I'm, I'm faithful to that, I feel like I'm failing over here in this area. And then if I serve this need, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, my kids don't get corrected. And if, if I meet this need, then all of a sudden the sermon doesn't get written. And if I don't meet this need, then it's... And so you, you're sitting there and you're kind of like, well, man, I, I don't know. But that's the point. Jesus is simply saying, look, all of those decisions between priorities plural, are going to make themselves clear and evident when the priority remains untouched. The priority must remain untouched because that's what Mary did. She was serving Christ. She was waiting on tables too, and she forsook that post for whatever reason. We don't know her, her, her mindset. We don't know the motives. It's not even part of the story, but she did realize that I need to make a decision because right now, in my heart, I need to go sit at Christ's feet, and I need to learn his word and so she abandoned the hospitality to become a learner. And she knew that the priority is the priority. And it's better to receive than to give. <laughs> How about that? Maybe that's the way to say it. Of course, Paul is talking about horizontal. But that's actually how we need to think about it when it comes to vertical. With our relationship with Christ, it's, it's better to receive than to give. Like, what are we honestly going to give him? Look, Lord, see the place settings? Look, Lord, look at this day planner, just chock full of check marks. I know you needed that. And he's just saying, no, I just, I just wanted you to keep the priority of the priority. Just sit at my feet and receive, learn. And if you keep that priority, the priority, all of those other tensions will resolve themselves. You'll have clarity because now the selfish ambition, the significance of these tasks, the significance we get from being excelling in this discipleship relationship or having won this battle, being able to pass on our wisdom to the disciple and looking like faithful parents, looking like a successful host, all of those things, just all the clamor and all the turmoil and all those ambitions and desires, the ones that are for the God's glory are good, but they quiet and they're subdued under the desire to just make sure that I'm pleasing Christ. And then they fit. And they're going to fit in your busy life. They're going to fit in your busy world. And you're going to have discernment and wisdom to know how to navigate those genuinely legitimate tensions in your schedule. And so Mary has chosen the good part. It's a choice. And this will not be taken away from her, Jesus says. My glory as a host, now, I'm trying to put this in your, I mean, I've never struggled with that. I have no, I have like next to no hosting abilities. I'm mean, like, if I prepare a meal, April's just like embarrassed and she's cringing like, oh my goodness, did you just put a gallon jug of milk on the coffee table forever? <laughs> yeah, we need some cream. What's the big deal? Big whoop. Okay, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to say this in your, I'm, not, I'm trying to put this in your vernacular here, so I, I, don't, I don't struggle with that. I have no significance there. I, I, I'll find, I'll be tempted to find significance in other areas for sure. The issue is, have we chosen the good part? It is a choice. And this requires self-denial. Ladies, sometimes you're going to have to say no to the very things that you excel at, to the very things that you um, are, are best at. There are areas, you, I mean, I'm looking, at this, I'm looking at the audience here, and this church is so full of highly gifted women. You are going to have to, at times, say no to things that are your wheelhouse, your area of expertise. And honestly, if that becomes a source of significance, Christ probably won't give you a lot of time excelling at areas that would fuel your sense of self-significance in that particular aspect of service in the church. 
And you're going to have to make a choice to say, Lord, I, there, there's something more important than serving the way that I want to serve. There's something more important than meeting the needs that I really feel comfortable meeting. I just want to be willing to do whatever you want me to do. I want to just be content to make sure that this priority of sitting at your feet and learning from you and glorifying you and serving you, regardless of who knows and regardless of who sees and regardless of what gets done, that you would reign supreme in my heart and that's all that matters. Self-denial is necessary for following Christ, and it, deny, it involves denying things that aren't even in themselves wrong. I mean, obviously we have to deny things that are wrong. I mean, that's, that's, worldliness has to go. We can't serve Christ with worldliness in our heart. We've got to constantly remain vigilant in that area. But there's times where our devotion to Christ is going to mean that we have to say no to things that we actually enjoy even in the church. Mary was listening at Christ's feet because she knew that when it comes to being with Jesus, it is better to receive than to give. In a few months' time, after this story, Jesus is again in the home. You can read about it in John chapter 12. She breaks the nard and anoints Jesus as an act of worship to prepare his body for burial a week before most of his following even realized he was going to die. I mean, this is a woman of faith, and her devotion to Christ sitting at his word does not make her lazy. She is a woman of action in John 12, and she gets after a profound act of displaying Christ's worth and even in, receives the rebuke of Judas and the disciples at the costly expense. And Jesus says, are, are you kidding me? This act is going to be spoken of wherever the gospel's preached. And sure enough, it's recorded in John 12. Mary's devotion to Christ and sitting at his feet does not produce passivity. It's not that she's just in some sort of quietistic, pietistic mode that never gets after um, fervent, energetic service of the Lord. John 12 disproves that notion. But John 12, I don't believe, happens without Luke 10. I don't think, like when you're reading John 12, you're thinking, like, how in the world did Mary know all that? I mean, this is like, what, what in the world? It's, like, it's almost like she already read the gospel and the gospel hadn't even been written yet. Well, she was sitting at Christ's feet, learning from his word. She's hearing him expose the Old Testament and she's thinking about those prophecies and she's connecting the dots of what the prophets have already said would happen. I mean, everything, everything except the doctrine of the church is in the, in the Old Testament. So Mary's learning about those things and she's connecting dots about the resurrection and the seed promise and all of it. And then there it is, Passion Week. And she's anointing him. This is it. This is how it's going to go down. And everybody else is just 10 steps behind, including the apostles. Because Mary had been sitting at Jesus' feet listen, listening to his word. And so ladies, I just want to ask you, Your greatest contribution to ministry might be something where you are most naturally gifted. It might even be something that has to be held in check. But how do you know, how do you know when daily concerns become spiritual distraction? And this is where I want to end. We have, a, we have an outline here of just four, four, concern, four ways that you can know when your concerns become spiritual distraction. Number one, when you exalt them above learning from Christ. You know that daily concerns can become spiritual distraction when you exalt them above learning from Christ. And, and I don't, I, when, if, you're, if you're taking notes or if you're just pondering that, I don't want to make that a simplistic point. As if what I were saying is, oh man, you are failing because you got your kids to school on time and you didn't read 15 minutes that morning. No, 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 don't, don't, don't hear that in a simplistic way. That would be completely unhelpful. Completely unhelpful. When I say you know it becomes a spiritual distraction when you exalt them above learning from Christ, I, I get it. There are going to be days and maybe even a week in your life where you are actually not spending as much time in the Word as you would like. Well, you're not disobeying the Lord if you don't read your Bible 10 minutes or 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes every day. 
you're disobeying the Lord if you don't long and hunger for the word like a babe longs for milk. That's when you're sinning, is when you don't long for it. And God might put on a particular day a certain set of responsibilities and burdens that actually keep you from, uh, in, in a formal sense, sitting down and reading his word the way that you would like. But if that's your hunger and that's your desire and you're thankful for the opportunity to pour yourself out under a serious burden of responsibility, you'll be content. You'll be rejoicing. Your heart will be quiet. Your, your heart will be will be uh, uh, calm. It won't be frenetic. It won't be racing. But what I am saying is, in your heart of hearts, when you find it easier and more attractive to just knock those responsibilities out and take care of those daily concerns, and learning from Christ does not become a priority, you know that you've become spiritually distracted. Number two, you make them the standard for others, right? I mean, how, how easy is that? You have an area where you excel and you do it a certain way and it seems like it was useful for ministry, but in your heart, it's no longer just, oh, thank you, Lord, that was useful and it was effective and you're humbled by it. It's, yeah, that was useful and effective, you know, and you, should, you can learn from me. And you start imposing your way of doing things or your priorities on others. It's like Martha with Mary. Jesus, tell her to get, start helping me. Number three, another way you know that your daily concerns have become spiritual distractions is when you perform them with expectations. When you serve in such a way that there are expectations about the fruit, about the response, about how people will receive it, about what it's going to accomplish, then you know that your daily concerns have become spiritual distractions. And fourth, you know that it's a distraction when you can't, subject, you can't subject them to spiritual priorities. This is what happens when you find that you cannot relinquish the hold on areas where you get significance that prevent you from keeping your devotion to Christ the priority. I titled this Worried Away from the Word. It could equally have been titled Worried Away from the Lord. You cannot separate Christ or His words. You can't separate Him from His words. He said, if you're ashamed of me or my words on the day that I return. Mary was devoted to Christ and his words. Do not let your daily concerns worry you away from the word from the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this story of Mary and Martha. It's just such a helpful and rich little story. And Lord, it's so penetrating to our own hearts because I know that seeing heart motives brought to light in, the, in a narrative like this, it's just so vivid because I can see, and I pray that these um, dear sisters can see, areas where we might need to grow, areas where daily concerns and daily distractions, burdens, anxieties, um, undue, undue consideration have actually distracted us from the priority. Lord, I do pray that there is nothing that would be able to root out or push away a priority of being devoted to you. A devotion to you and a devotion to your word is going to be the source of all wisdom, all usefulness, all holiness. It's going to be a, a foundation for our life. When we start building our life on, on the principles we learn from your word, when we start making decisions about the tensions in our schedule based on the priority of being devoted to you, Lord, all of it's going to take, it's going to, it's going to fit perfectly because we're not going to be grabbing on to certain responsibilities for selfish ambition or for jealous purposes. We'll be glad to just obey. We'll be glad to just do whatever you've told us to do because we'll want to give you all glory and honor. And so, Lord, I just pray that this would help us to root out the, dis the potential distractions of normal daily concerns and burdens. And give these women incredible wisdom with all of the influence that you've given to the ladies in this room, with all of the responsibilities that you've entrusted to their care. I pray that they would view all of those as expendable for the sake of making sure that this priority is their priority. In your name we pray. Amen.